In the romantic rolling hills flanking the Danube River in Austria stands the notorious Nazi concentration camp at Matthausen. This slave labor camp functioned from 1938 to 1945 for the exploitation of Hitler's opponents and victims. More than half of its 200,000 prisoners died here, mostly from starvation or exhaustion. Like many camps, Matthausen was located at a quarry. Inmates generally labored for the German armaments industry or quarrying stone for vast Nazi building projects. The long stairway that connected the quarry with the camp and the stone depot earned the name Stairway of Death for good reason. In a concentration camp like Mauthausen, your ability to endure forced labor amounted to a stay of execution. With the harshest of conditions and a starvation diet, if you weren't able to carry slabs of rock on your back up this stairway all day long, you'd be shot on the spot. Much of Mauthausen is a memorial park where each country has erected a gripping monument to their citizens who perished here. Many yellowed photos have fresh flowers, indicating loved ones are still not forgotten. This camp reminds us of the fervent wish of those who endured this Holocaust, never forget. Just across the border, in Germany, the architect of this genocide, Adolf Hitler, built a mountain hideout at Berchtesgaden. He eventually built a vast Nazi headquarters up here, which served as a second capital of the Third Reich and an impressive place to wow visiting diplomats. Today, a museum sits upon what remains of the bombed-out compound. Its purpose? To help Germans understand and learn from their recent history. Hitler's Spinmeisters capitalized on the Fuhrer's love of this region to establish the notion that the former Austrian was truly a German at heart. From the museum, local guide David Harper joins us as we enter a vast bunker system. It was started in 1943, after the Battle of Stalingrad ended the Nazi aura of invincibility. This incredibly engineered, climate-controlled underground maze was a virtual city. It came complete with meeting rooms and offices for the government, lavish living quarters for Hitler, and four miles of tunnels cut by forced labor through solid rock. It never hosted the desperate last stand for which it was built. At the bottom of this 100-foot shaft was an entrance to Hitler's private bunker. This was below his huge home. It was extremely luxuriously fitted out, parquet wooden floors, wood paneling everywhere, marble in the bathroom, gold leaf taps, a library, a music room. You name it, he had it. It was palatial down there for him to make his last stand when the end of the war finally came. From here, buses zigzag visitors up a dramatic and breathtaking road. The road was built in 1938 to bring Hitler and his guests up to a gift built for the dictator's 50th birthday, a mountain-capping chalet nicknamed the Eagle's Nest. From the bus stop, a stone tunnel crafted with fascist precision leads to Hitler's plush elevator, which whisks you to the top. While a fortune was spent to build this perch with its obedient stonework, Hitler made only 14 official visits. Today, the Eagle's Nest is open as a cafe and jumping off point for hikers. Because it was here that Hitler claimed to be inspired and laid out his dark vision, some call Berchtesgaden the cradle of the Third Reich. All across Europe, there were people who bravely fought Hitler any way they could. At Copenhagen's Nazi Resistance Museum, we learn how, eventually, the Danish underground heroically resisted German occupation. Germany invaded and occupied neutral Denmark in 1940. Expecting a quick Nazi victory, the Danes, as they're inclined to do, cooperated. Because of this cooperation, or maybe the food they produced for Germany, or maybe because Hitler approved of their Aryan ethnicity, Denmark enjoyed a privileged special status and was allowed virtual autonomy. In fact, thousands of Danes volunteered to fight with the Nazis against the USSR. At first, there was only rare and symbolic resistance, like red, white, and blue pro-Britain caps 
and Yankee Doodle bow ties. By 1943, many Danes were angered by the use of Danish factories in the German war machine, and they were emboldened as Allied victories broke the sense of Nazi invincibility. As this new spirit kindled hopes of an Allied victory, the Danish resistance grew stronger. An underground newspaper, The Free Dane, was published by heroic young journalists. Secret homemade radio transmitters connected Danes with resistance leadership in London. Trained operatives parachuted in from Britain to organize a more serious resistance. Train lines were blown up. Danish ingenuity showed itself in homemade guns and torpedoes. This one's addressed to a German warship. With D-Day and the invasion of Normandy, the Free Dane came out in a special color edition. And it was only a matter of time before the Nazis were gone and Denmark was free, with the rest of Europe soon to follow. 